Hey everybody, it's your old pal Mike. I hope you're happy, healthy, and safe, and welcome back to the channel for a very special On the Bench episode. In front of me, I have perhaps one of the most important bases of my life, and it's not because it was owned by a famous person, it's not because it was on my favorite record, it's because it belongs to one of my very close friends. In fact, one of my oldest. I think my boy Greg and I have known each other for like 25 years at this point. And he is still one of my favorite people in the entire world. A uh, little bit about Greg. Not only is he the owner of this bass, but he's the owner of that Marshall head I'm borrowing. And uh, he's given me permission to buy it. So, JCM2000, woo woo! JCM2000! But Greg is also one of the most fun people I know. He is incredibly kind and caring. Always good for a quick laugh. He's a movie buff. He's always got recommendations. If you haven't seen something, he's got a review for you. And another thing I love about Greg is that he's turned into a fantastic father. That's one of my favorite things about having been back in Pennsylvania is seeing my old friends and Greg ranks among them at the highest level. He is one of my favorite people in the world, and I cannot wait to work on his great bass. Now, the reason this bass is so important to me is because Greg played it, and when I was just starting to play shows in 9th, 10th grade, one of the first people I met in the scene was Greg, and Greg was the first bass player that I ever saw play power chords. And I remember being at the front of the stage, song got more intense, here comes the chorus, Greg hit a B power chord. And I remember my whole body shaking, and I was blown away by the sound. I couldn't believe that you could do that on bass. Previously, I'd only ever seen people go... You know that, which is great. Not knocking that style of bass playing, but... Oh, is there anything darker and moodier? I don't know. And another thing that made Greg such a formidable bass player in my mind was he had one of the craziest, most piecemeal rigs I have ever seen in my life, and it sounded great. Let me give you a brief rundown. Now, I don't remember the model name, but the first amp in his rig was an Ampeg combo that was much taller than it was wide. It was like a 210, maybe, but upright but it was on its side. And on top of it was a 412 Gens Benz cab, which was being driven by a PVCS 400 rack unit in the rack with the associated PV preamp that I don't remember the name of. So that was beside it. And if he was feeling saucy, sometimes Greg would also throw an Ampeg BA-115 or a 112 on top of that. So he's got yet another amp in the mix. And then when Greg finally acquired his dream amp, which is an Ampeg SVT4 Pro, like a 1200 watt bass amp, and the 810 anniversary cab, uh, I mean, he preferred that, but sometimes he just bring everything, especially if it were an outdoor show. And I remember so many sound people going like, hey, how many amps do you need? And Greg would just look and he would go, I don't know, that many? And his sound was enormous. Not only were all of the individual amps taking up a different part of the frequency range, but his overall sound was, it was heavy and mids forward. As a bass player, I can think of so few people who anchored a band the way that Greg did. And he, uh, he's just a hero to me. I absolutely love him. But eventually, after getting the SVT4 Pro, he was like, I need a pro bass. And so he ended up with this Music Man Sterling, which is, God, just a fantastic bass. I don't get to talk about Music Man very much, but Music Man makes one hell of an instrument, and this one is no different. I remember when he first got this bass and how proud of it he was. He was babying it, even though he was a hard player using a super thick pick, sometimes like two millimeters, three millimeters. <laughs> But he took pretty good care of it, and it has, much like Greg and myself, uh, it has aged <laughs> gracefully over the years with just a few scars here and there and a little bit of finish checking and damage. You know, some chips on the back, that's to be expected. But overall, this thing is great. So, I said all of that to say this. This bass and its owner mean a lot to me, and I am so happy to have this on the bench today. And without further ado, let's set this thing up. And in true Mr. Rogers fashion, I'm going to don <laughs> the apron. The apron of doom. 
So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to pull the strings off and I'm going to clean the heck out of this fretboard because it has not seen a whole lot of action in some time. First things first, let's get these strings off because they are very old. <laughs> And in the interest of cleaning, I am just going to cut them all the way off. We're going to take care of this fretboard. I've already had a little bit of a look at this thing to see what's going on, and I'm happy to report that relief is pretty okay. Um, I may make an adjustment using an implement in the little adjustment wheel here, but overall, the base is in pretty good shape. And in fact, I just plugged it in and not even the electronics are showing signs of age. There's no crackling or a uh, dropped out signal. It's really doing well. Got a fresh pad of steel wool here. And although the steel wool shouldn't make it all the way down to the pickup, I am just gonna tape it off to prevent steel wool fibers from destroying this wonderful Music Man pickup. A lot of people don't like to use steel wool on guitars. And, uh, you know, if there were a much better way, maybe I would switch, but still the finest way to take care of your frets. So if you're going to steal wool a guitar, cover the pickups, tape them up, do something to prevent fibers from getting in there. Ah, it's shining up beautifully. There's very little finger grease or cheese on here, which is a phrase that a lot of people hate to hear, so I do apologize if that's you. And like I always say, if you're using steel wool, go side to side not up and down the neck, so that you don't leave tiny scratches in the frets that you will often hear if you bend across the neck. Probably not, you know, a super common thing to do on the bass, but some bass players like to bend it up a little bit, and I want you to have that option with that little ching, 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 as you do it. You know, I got to tour the Ernie Ball Music Man factory not too long ago, thanks to my friend Robert, who works there. Uh, and it was one of the most thrilling experiences of my life. I got to see where some really cool modern guitars are being made. And I gotta say, my favorite part was their finish department. Because at the time, they were just in the earliest stages of producing the St. Vincent model. And that happens to be one of my favorite guitars that I have ever played. Maybe one of the most exciting signature models, too. The hot pink St. Vincent. I still think about that one. Maybe someday. Maybe I can convince them to put a mastery tram on one of those and yeah, that'll be right up my alley. All right, that is a clean fretboard. Vacuum up. Now it should be no surprise that this thing needs some cleaning. So the first thing I'm gonna do is apply a little bit of lemon oil to a cloth and apply that to the neck. Give that wood a little drink. Yeah. We're just gonna let that soak in for a minute before I wipe away the excess. It's important not to overdo it with lemon oil because you can cause problems. All you really need is just a little drink periodically through the year, maybe once every three or six months. But just a little drink will do. And I'm gonna pull this tape off so that I can thoroughly clean the rest of this base. What's, what, what is this tape doing here? Oh, okay, I see why the tape is there. I think I might just cover that back up. That is, wow, that is one hell of a ding. Just gonna pretend I didn't see that. Now this base isn't particularly dirty, so I think I can just get away with using Meguiar's instead of using some polish or some damp cloth to kind of free up some dirt. I think we'll be okay. Before I do that, I am going to wipe away the excess oil on the neck, prevent any more from sinking in, because we've got plenty of coverage. That'll do nicely. Yeah, I mean, believe it or not, I think Ernie Ball makes a fantastic instrument, and that's coming from somebody who basically, you know, only plays a lot of vintage Fender-style instruments, jazz masters, jaguars, you know, I love a good Esquire now and again. So, you know, for me to for me to really find something interesting about Music Man, well, that's, oh, that's sort of miraculous if you think about it. But yeah, I'm a big fan of the company. I really like the innovations. I mean, the fact that it was a company started by Leo Fender is interesting to me and lovely. Same with G&L. But yeah, I have nothing but great things to say about Ernie Ball, Music Man. You know, of course, I love the strings. I use them on a lot of things. The basses, to my mind, are sort of iconic. For a long time, I swore the only bass I'd ever play was a Stingray. 
Uh, and then eventually I got a P-Base, uh, which <laughs> seemed to fit my needs a little bit better. But still, to this day, I would, man, I would love a Stingray or a Sterling. And I think if I'm honest, my love of the Stingray comes directly from Mike Herrera from MXPX, which is a band that I, I listened to way too much of back in the day. Uh, but man, what a great band. They were a lot of fun. And man, the one show that I saw of them was incredible. Mike lit his bass on fire. Just an incredibly good time. What a great band. So many good memorable songs. Uh, yeah, I really, I really liked that group. All right, so with Meguiar's polish, you want to apply a little bit, let it sit there for a minute so it clouds up, and then you want to polish it out. It's basically like buffing compound, like 32,000 grit paper in liquid form. So I will just hit every area that I covered in the stuff with the un saturated portion of my cloth and that should take care of dirt and grime and fingerprints and sometimes even scratches sometimes this stuff is good enough that it can get rid of uh, surface level scratches let's get the back real quick not too bad here I might also polish up the neck just a touch <laughs> So I have had two songs stuck in my head for well over a week. And one of them is Deep Sea Diver's Impossible Wait. Deep Sea Diver, amazing band. If you haven't checked them out, do so. Also good friends. I've teched for them in the past on their dates with Wilco. And what a <laughs> wonderful honor that was. And I've also got that new John Mayer tune rattling around in my old brain. Um, boy, uh, I really like it. I think I'm about ready for strings, and for that, I will be using a set of Ernie Ball Hybrid Slinkies, gauge 45 to 105. Pretty great set of strings that I enjoy. Like I said, this bass didn't really need a whole lot of attention. It's in pretty good shape, despite its age and lack of use. Get the brush in there, yep. Oh, look at all that. Detritus. This little thing has become one of my most used tools. It's by Music Nomad. It's a little polishing stick <laughs> with a brush on the end of it. And that brush, what a lifesaver. Now for the three-in-one Ernie Ball style headstock, I like to measure two tuners past the one I'm stringing, and then a little extra, and cut. And that will usually give me exactly the amount of string that I need to wind around the post. And you don't need as much on Ernie Ball tuners as you would on like a P-Bass, because they're graduated, or sort of conical, or fluted, or flouted, or whatever they are, but the tuners have sort of a conical shaft on them, which pushes the string downward. And I normally don't like that, but it happens to work really well on these bases. So I am more than happy to follow that design cue. And perfect. That is exactly the amount of string that I want to see. Yep, adequate downward force, plenty of winds. But now you're saying, Mike, didn't you say measure two tuners passed? What if you don't have a tuner passed? Well, you just pull it back there's the second tuner, and then I'll cut right here. Boom. Easy trick. Also, another shout out to my trusty Music Nomad Tuner Turner. What is this called? What are these things called? Wrist savers? Well, I can't believe I'm forgetting what this is called. String Winder Tuner Turner. Ah, the music of Tuner Turner. <laughs> All right, and we got the G. So I'm gonna do kind of the same thing. You know, it's been a while, but I think if I hold this here, two turners passed, two tuners passed, and I cut, we should be in good shape. Yeah, that's just a little bit easier. Less winding. That's so awkward getting from this side. Ooh. It's not a criticism about the Ernie Ball headstock. 
It's more like my right wrist doesn't work the same way as my left. Ah, sweet, sweet music. Now we've got the strings on and we're feeling pretty good. I'm just gonna have a look at this action and you know what? Actually, not that bad. I think I may even stick with this. All right, feeling pretty good. Obviously not in tune. I think I might just stick with this action. I might lower the G a little bit. This is a little bit up there, but... How's that? Relief. Fine. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna adjust this neck at all. Yeah, I feel pretty good about this actually. I I was expecting to do a whole setup, but there's very little that I need to do. I, think I might lower I mean, it's so slinky, no pun intended. You know, I might not really do a whole lot to this. I don't even think I want to lower the G. Greg, I think your bass might be fine. Let's just true up the intonation and call it good. Because sometimes that's all you really need. And for intonation, we are going to set to series, roll the volume back, bass it full, treble and mids down. And I'm gonna balance the bass here and tune in playing position. Yeah, I finally got it. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, now that I have it upright, where's my nine and a half radius gauge? Let's just check the radius. You know, G and D are a little bit proud. I am going to lower them just a little bit. To do that, I don't necessarily think I need to unlock those little studs at either side of the bridge that are there to prevent lateral movement, but sometimes I find it a little bit easier to adjust the saddles with these things loosened a little bit, so. Maybe that's superstition, I don't know. We're just gonna roll with it because it's my channel and I can do what I want. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's a lot better already. We can get that D down as well, just a little bit. Yeah. Feels a little bit better. I know that some of you are screaming about me using a pick on the bass, but you know what? I don't care. <laughs> All of my favorite bass players use a pick. Um, Georg Holm from Sigur Rós, obviously. You know, Paul McCartney used a pick sometimes. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on. I don't have to uh, defend my preferences. I just love the sound of a pick on bass. Moving on. A little bit sharp, no big deal. Ooh, just slightly flat. We're right in the range. Now, if Greg decides he's going to get back into playing bass at some point, if he's able to, I know that Greg has an extraordinarily heavy right hand. 
I remember watching him slam this thing on stage. So perhaps the lowest string, I may intonate slightly flat, as I often find that I have to do with players who have an extraordinarily heavy pick attack. There was one guy in LA that I did work for in a sort of well-known band, the famous lead singer. That guy, I have never seen anybody hit a guitar harder in my life. And when he first came to me, he was complaining that every time he played his guitar, it was constantly pulling sharp. And he was trying all kinds of ways to fix that. He was tuning the guitar flat. He was tuning the guitar in a number of very interesting ways to try to combat that. But the solution that presented itself that worked best was just making all of his notes slightly flat at the bridge. And that way, when he hit the bridge as hard as he liked, instead of pulling sharp, the notes would pull upward into pitch. And thus he'd be in tune with the rest of his band, thus he wouldn't have to worry about uh, drop D especially sounding so far off. Uh, and it worked really well, and he was very pleased with the work. And the reason I knew that that was a thing you could do is because I also have a heavy right hand. And you know, when I was a Gibson only guy, and I still miss some of those guitars, uh, I found <laughs> that, you know, sometimes I was pulling a wee bit sharp. So that is a way that you too can mitigate intonation issues. Pull it back a little bit more right on that line of being perfectly intoned. Can you keep going? Yeah. Now how is this E? Slightly sharp. Just a tiny, tiny bit. Plucked, I'm slightly flat, and now I'm slightly <laughs> right on. Yes. Yeah. All right, I'm going to stretch the strings, but before I do that, I'm going to tighten down these studs on either side of the bridge. I don't remember what the correct term is for them, so Ernie Ball, Music Man, please forgive me for my insolence and ignorance. Let's stretch the strings, and the easiest way and best way that I know to do it is not the, you know, stretch, stretch, stretch method. I just pull up at the 12th fret and retune. I do this about four or five times. And you can hear that with each stretch, it's staying closer to the note. And we're only a little bit out. This should be the last one. Perfect. That was five. Let's do the A string. Oh, that one's pretty good. Yep. 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 And... Pretty darn good. The setup is almost finished. Now before I plug in and play test, I want to check this battery because I have no idea how old it is. And that's always a good thing to do for your friends, but also your regular customers will appreciate you checking out their battery. So this is a standard nine volt battery. Utilitech is not a brand that I know, so no comment on whether or not that is a good brand. But let's see what we're working with, how close it is to nine volts. And 8.75, it's actually pretty good. So I don't think I need to put a brand new one in. Now I'm, Admittedly, not much of a bass player, but we're gonna plug in real quick and just see how we did. So I'm just plugged into Greg's Marshall behind me and we're gonna listen to every pot, make sure everything works.
You may not know this, but these marshals are fantastic for playing bass through. If you're going to use a marshal to play bass, get one of the 100 watt DSLs, but that deep switch like makes these a pretty formidable and viable bass amp. <laughs> okay, I promise I will never slap again. That's actually kind of fun. I've forgotten how much fun slapping can be. All right, I've got everything at five on the EQ, so let's just run through what the available sounds on the Sterling are like. Uh, this is position three, the series position. Position two, which is the phantom coil or single coil, sort of as I understand it. And position one, which is parallel both coils. Yeah, pretty good. I think I like position three the best. Let's back off the treble, raise the mids, raise the bass. And in honor of Greg, a power chord. <laughs> Man, what is that one bass thing that I remember? Ah, when there's nothing left to burn, you have to set yourself on fire. Anyway, I think this has been a rather successful on the bench episode. In any case, I appreciate you listening to me go on and on and on about my friend Greg and how much he means to me and how much his bass means to me. It is such a treat to be able to approach these instruments in a completely different way from the way I interacted with them back in the 90s and 2000s. I have had this bass in my life intermittently throughout the years, and every time I'm always impressed with it, I'm always in love with it, but more than that, like I said, it just means something to me. It's a, it's a touchstone to a simpler, uh, <laughs> younger time for me. And at the same time, I am really excited that I got to approach this as not a musician today, but as a guitar technician, to be able to clean it and give it the attention that it so desperately needed. So, ah, <sighs> the Sterling. I think you're far better than when you came in, but you weren't that bad to begin with. What a great bass. In any case, thank you so much for watching, for liking, for sharing, for commenting, for subscribing, for doing all of those things that the algorithm deems essential to the survival of a channel on YouTube. And an extra special shout out to my supporters on Patreon. I love you. I appreciate you. You're keeping me going. You're keeping this channel alive. And I am so excited to see what we can do together. If you are interested in learning how you too can support the channel, please click the link in the description below. All right. I am, uh... I'm gonna play this a little bit more, reminisce about the good old times, and uh, then I'm gonna give it back to Greg. <laughs> but it's gonna be a day or two before I do that, so I'm gonna spend some time with this. And in the meantime, I hope that you're taking care of yourselves and each other, and we'll see you in the next video.